So good afternoon, everyone. It's Catherine and Gunnis and Andrea here at RNEO. Thanks so much for attending today's webinar. We're delighted to have you with us. Um, and um, as you'll see, we had uh, quite a high response to this webinar presentation. And so for that reason, then we switched it uh, just to the WebEx. So again, thank you for uh, attending today. So today we're going to talk about our recently released best practice guideline, Assessment and Interventions for Perinatal Depression, our second edition. And this presentation is being recorded um, so that uh, if you're not able to attend all of the uh, presentation and or uh, have a colleague not able to attend today, um, they'll be able to listen to this in the future. So uh, welcome again. My name is Catherine Wallace and I'm the Guideline Development Lead for uh, this CPG. Um, my background is nursing and midwifery, and uh, I'm joined today by my colleague, Glynis, who will introduce herself. Hi, everyone. I'm Glynis. Um, I've been in touch with most of you via email, and I sent you the registration information yesterday. I'm the project coordinator with that worked on this guideline with Catherine and um, also with Phyllis and Angela, yeah. And Angela, did you want to introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Angela Bowen. I'm sitting here in uh, Saskatoon at the University of Saskatchewan, where I'm a professor in nursing. Oh, thanks, Angela and Phyllis. And good afternoon. My name is Phyllis. I'm in the School of no uh, Nursing in Northern Ontario, and welcome. Thanks, Phyllis, and uh, thanks to both Angela and to Phyllis for joining us. Uh, as you can see, they were both the uh, co-chairs for our expert panel for this best practice guideline. Uh, we thank both of them for their involvement and support of the guideline and their participation in today's webinar. I want to just briefly just recognize uh, the other members of our team here at RNEO that worked on this best practice guideline. Uh, we have research uh, uh, methodologists that worked on the guideline, uh, coordinators that provide administrative support and technical support, as you can see today, our senior management team that provides leadership and guidance, as well as other colleagues that support us in implementation strategies. So uh, just a recognition of the full RNAO team that worked on this guideline um, to help it uh, reach publication. Our objectives for today, we have three. Uh, so we're wanting to talk about guideline development process, including the systematic reviews uh, that were used to inform this best practice guideline. Uh, we want to highlight the guideline recommendations. And we'll talk a little bit about um, implementation support. Uh, we create guidelines at RNAO with the intention not only that they inform knowledge, but also to be used in education and clinical practice. Uh, so we talk about some of the supports and resources that we've created for that purpose. Um, in recognizing that many of you today probably are wanting to hear about the guideline recommendations, we've chosen to put those at the front of this presentation um, so as to ensure that we have adequate time um, to, um, uh, to discuss those. If you're not familiar with the RNAO, um, the Registered Nurses Association of Ontario is the professional association for RNs, NPs, and nursing students here in the province of Ontario. Uh, we have two key mandates to influence and promote healthy public policy as well as clinical excellence. And we feel we support clinical excellence for nurses and other members of the healthcare team uh, through our best practice guidelines or what we call our BPGs. Uh, this year we have over 42,000 members in RNAO. It's our highest number ever, so we really appreciate our members and their active involvement. Uh, so we have 54 best practice guidelines. The majority of them focus on clinical uh, topics, including perinatal depression. And then we have 12 in the area of system and healthy work environment. Um, um, this screenshot then is of our, um, the perinatal depression uh, web page. So if you log on to rnao.ca, uh, and then look under the tab of best practice guidelines. You can do a search uh, for perinatal depression or depression, uh, and you should find this guideline. Uh, I want you also to see that uh, in the top right there, it says contact us, just above the policy and political action. If you have any questions regarding any of our guidelines, um, that's a way of reaching us. I also will include my email at the end of this presentation. Um, here also you will find the link for the free download of this BPG, um, and we encourage you to uh, look at the guideline as an electronic uh, document. There are many links that you'll find to uh, supporting resources, uh, so certainly you can read the guideline that way. 
Um, in the upcoming months or so, we should have this guideline also available as a print copy for purchase. And this is where you would find that if you're wanting to make such a purchase. I know some people like to read our guidelines in print as well. This is the bottom of that same web page. Um, here you will find uh, a blog that was written from one of our board of directors um, who described her experiences with postpartum depression. Uh, we also had, uh, in the month of October, a media conference, uh, and that was videotaped and that you can watch as well. Also on this page, you will find related files, including the bibliography that we used for um, informing the recommendations. It also includes the quality appraisal of each of those studies. Uh, we also have a file that details the search strategies that were used for each of the research questions that informs this best practice guideline, as well as the declaration of competing interests, and that's from our panel members. And this is to ensure quality and uh, transparency as far as our guideline development processes uh, and an indication of quality as far as just the development. So. So, so uh, relative to a brief introduction about this guideline, it replaces that of 2005. Its focus remains on the person who is at risk of or experiencing prenatal depressive symptoms. Their partner's experiences are included in an appendix. A difference between the two postpartum depression guidelines is that the current version includes a synthesis of evidence regarding altered mood during pregnancy to ensure the inclusion of more contemporary evidence about prenatal depression and early interventions to promote the health before and after the birth of the child. Thereby, the 2018 guideline can be used by a variety of professionals in diverse healthcare settings, inclusive of and not limited to nurse practitioner-led clinics, family doctors, or midwives or obstetricians, family health teams, community health centers, public health, uh, aboriginal health access centers, or acute care. Additionally, the guideline can be implemented in mental health services and support for prenatal depression, such as psychiatry, counseling sessions, schools, and other academic settings. The purpose of this guideline is twofold. First, to provide nurses and other health professionals with an evidence with evidence-based recommendations for persons at risk for or experiencing prenatal depression. This guideline uses the term person to be inclusive of anyone who experiences a depression during pregnancy and postpartum. We recognize that childbearing child -bearing women may not identify with the descriptor terms such as woman or mother. The second purpose is to promote comprehensive prenatal depression care, inclusive of screening, assessment, prevention for persons at increased risk or women with early symptoms of depression, also, the guideline addresses interventions and evaluations. Thanks, Liz. Um, for all of our guidelines, we include guiding principles. Uh, this provides the broader context of the guideline, uh, and addresses any underlying values that we felt were important for the reader to understand in order to give the guidelines some context. So we've got three key guiding principles. The first one, social determinants of health, or more, more specifically, social determinants of mental health. This recognizes that um, persons who experience perinatal depression disproportionately are at increased risk if they also face inequities. So someone who lives with poverty, someone who lives with violence, someone who experiences discrimination in their life can be at increased risk of uh, perinatal depression. Um, and it recognizes, too, that there is a role and a need for nurses, other members of the healthcare team, 
to advocate to eliminate these modifiable factors. Person-centered care is that we need to approach perinatal depression care components in a way that is holistic, in a way that reflects what the person's goals are, and that recognizes that um, persons bring a knowledge and strength as to what approaches to care can be most effective for them. Lastly, informed decision making. This recognizes, respects, and promotes, and promotes a person's right to autonomous decision making. And we know over the course of pregnancy, labor, both postpartum, that there are a number of decisions that a person needs to make. And we know that as nurses and other healthcare providers, that we can play a key role in helping to support their informed decision making, as opposed to them using other sources, like perhaps their, their mother or their sister or a lady on YouTube. Oh, hi, it's Angela. There's three types of recommendations that you'll find in the report. The first are practice recommendations. That is what the healthcare provider nurse needs to do to, um, to enact the, the changes that we, we put forth. The second are education recommendations. What do you need to know? So you need background information to make the changes. And importantly, what the system organization and policy um, recommendations for those to go through. What does the organization need to do? It's really important because we can't expect um, care providers, nurses to just adopt practice recommendations or even education recommendations by themselves. They need support to do that and um, make those changes happen. Often it also involves money, of course, but um, in the guideline, you'll also see some evaluation measures, research gaps, and appendices that can be used at the point of care to support the application of these recommendations, because we know there can be challenges to this. We met in Toronto at the onset of this, and we developed four questions that would guide this um, guideline development. In the area of perinatal mental health, and it was important for, for me in particular, but for the group, that this change from postpartum to perinatal to acknowledge the antepartum period as well. In the area of perinatal mental health, what are effective screening and assessment strategies for identifying symptoms of depression during pregnancy and postpartum for up to one year after childbirth? In the area of perinatal mental health, what are the effective interventions for persons experiencing childbirth, depression during pregnancy and postpartum for up to one year after childbirth? In the area of education, what education and training in perinatal depression are required to ensure the provision of effective assessment and intervention among nurses and the interprofessional team and for the system? How do healthcare organizations and the broader healthcare system ensure optimal prevention, assessment, and interventions for perinatal assessment? So we did systematic reviews. Sorry, I have to go back. We did systematic reviews for each of these questions, and um, we were able to find reviews and, and new articles that we used. And for question two, three, and four, we use primary and review studies, Cochrane review, those types of things, due to the volume of research. Sometimes primary studies were included as examples from those. For question two, three, and four, both, um, oh, seems to be repeated there. Sorry, I, I turned to reading for a short time. Uh, for the first question, because there were less of these, we did, did just use primary studies. Thank you. So for practice recommendations, uh, what you're really wanting to learn from us today, 1.1 uh, was to routinely screen for the risk of perinatal depression using a valid tool as part of pre and postnatal care. Um, the benefits of this are seen to be that there are, is improved and earlier detection of those at risk for perinatal depression and there is a decrease in symptoms if a person is treated. We do talk about the Edinburgh Postnatal Depression Scale in the, the recommendations um, in the document, but we haven't mentioned it as such here. There are other tools that people can use. A comprehensive um, assessment, conduct or facilitate 
access to a comprehensive perinatal depression assessment with persons who screen positive for perinatal depression. So we all understand that screening is just a screen. You need to do uh, another step to determine a diagnosis and a plan of care. So this can include emotional status, health inequities, other psychosocial factors, which we know often accompany depression in um, people during the perinatal period. Um, what other kinds of things that, that we need to know? We need to be trustworthy, empathetic, and we know that people are much more likely to disclose um, these kinds of sensitive issues and get treatment if people are attentive to them. The third, 2.1, collaborate with the person to develop a comprehensive person-centered plan of care, including goals for those with a positive screen or assessment for perinatal depression. So it's a collaborative process, reflects their goals, not ours. Um, really important if they do have a partner, sometimes to make sure that partner's part of the plan of care so that they can help and be included with it. The guideline includes a table that has clinical considerations for following um, a screen or assessment for perinatal depression. Additional prenatal depression recommendations are uh, selective and targeted prevention, which involves early identifications for persons at risk for or developing pre prenatal depression symptoms, evidence about selective prevention practices such as psychoeducation and talk therapies are associated with decreased depression symptoms. There is limited evidence supporting universal, universal prevention at this time. 2.3 addresses promotion of self-care practice, practices which involve supporting persons' efforts to engage in positive everyday lifestyles Evidence suggests that time for self, exercise, relaxation, and sleep are health habits a person can independently adopt to optimize their health. 2.4, support seeking from a variety of sources is associated with a person's ability to cope with depressive symptoms. The sources of support include immediate and extended family, as well as peer support. Peer support, be it in person or via technologies, are often multimodal, and therefore it's challenging to determine the independent effects of peer support on depressive symptoms in the reviewed evidence. 2.5 addresses the delivery of psychoeducation interventions to offer opportunities for, to promote persons' self-efficacy through education about depression, modifying risk factors, and also promoting well-being. Ident uh, 2.6 is a group of psychosocial interventions which are purposeful, such as non-directive counseling, collaborative problem solving, home visiting, for the provision of opportunities for persons to identify solutions that are best for them. Studies, con uh, concern, uh, studies demonstrate an association between public health home visiting and symptom reduction in persons with prenatal depression. 2.7, the effect of formal psychological interventions such as cognitive behavioral therapy or interpersonal therapy on depressive symptom reduction is evident in the reviewed literature. Such talk therapies in a variety of formats, be it individual, group, or technologically mediated, are recommended as first-line treatment for persons with mild to moderate depression. For persons with severe depression, talk therapies in addition to medications is indicated. The therapist is typically a trained nurse or an interprofessional. Thanks, Phyllis. So our last three practice recommendations. 2.8 focuses on pharmacological interventions. It says support informed decision making and advocate for access to pharmacological interventions for perinatal depression as appropriate. 
uh, when we developed this recommend recommendation, uh, we recognized that for most nurses, they would not be the um, one prescribing an antidepressant or other um, medication that might be used for someone with perinatal depression. Nonetheless, we felt it was important that nurses have the knowledge and skill in order to support informed decision making. And that's why the recommendation is written the way that it does. So the kinds of uh, uh, knowledge that the nurse would need to have, uh, an understanding of individualized variables pertaining to pharmacology, pharmacology, so things like the severity of someone's symptoms or timing during pregnancy or if someone is lactating and what are the considerations. Um, it recognizes too that there are no zero risk options um, and that a delay or absence of treatment uh, can cause negative and adverse outcomes for the individual. So it's supporting the person around decision making. Again, looping back to that guiding principle that we talked about earlier. Uh, 2.9, facilitate informed decision making regarding the use of complementary and alternative medicine therapies for perinatal depression, or what some would refer to as CAM therapies. Uh, we know that persons during pregnancy and postpartum often are looking for what they might perceive of as natural uh, and perceive those therapies as being safe. Uh, they also can be therapies that someone can access autonomously. So for many reasons, they may be of interest to someone who is experiencing perinatal depression symptoms. Uh, we talk about uh, in the discussion of evidence uh, massage therapy, bright light therapy, and acupuncture as examples of CAM therapies. Uh, in general, um, there's limited evidence in this area. Many of these studies are small in terms of sample size um, with inconclusive results, meaning some showed a significant difference as far as depression scores before and after interventions, others did not. Um, and most of them indicate then that future studies are needed in order to further support um, this recommendation. So that's why it's written as facilitating informed decision making as opposed to this being a full recommendation. Uh, lastly, 2.10, evaluate and revise the plan of care. So it says evaluate and revise the plan of care for perinatal depression in collaboration with the person until goals are met to include the person's partner, family, and support network where applicable. And this recommendation is following nursing process that we know always includes that evaluation piece uh, so that we do uh, an examination of is the treatment, uh, whatever that treatment plan may be for the individual, uh, is that being, is it effective for them as far as reducing their depression symptoms. Uh, we'll take a break just from recommendations here. We've got just three slides about how to read the recommendations and we did make some changes in this guideline that you'll see. And uh, as part of registration, we asked if you had read or were familiar with the 05 edition interventions for postpartum depression. Many of you did indicate you were. Um, and so when you see this new edition, I think you'll see there are some changes and I hope that you like them. Uh, so when you see the recommendations, you'll see first there is the research question there. Um, and the research question really was the driver then for the recommendations. The research question was also linked back to the purpose and scope and also linked to the systematic review. Um, you'll see then in the recommendation box uh, the recommendation statement, an action oriented statement, and then below that the level of evidence for summary, so this is referring to the research design, and then the quality of evidence for summary is indicating then how many of those studies were of high, moderate, or low quality. Uh, for the most part, we chose to include only the high and moderate quality studies, uh, but where necessary we included low simply to give an example to support a recommendation statement. We also included some of the guidelines as well. Uh, you'll also see that we used Vancouver style as opposed to APA. Uh, so we moved away from sentences uh, in the discussion of evidence that would have read something like uh, a randomized control trial of moderate quality indicated, blah, 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 whatever, and then in brackets, uh, Wallace et al. 2018. Now the discussion of evidence uh, just indicates what the research finding was, and then there's a, a number at the end in parentheses, and that then refers to um, the reference, which is in the reference list. Angela. Angela. Sorry, I was on mute. <laughs> oh, okay, no worries. <laughs> um, for each of the recommendations, there's a discussion of the evidence that's made up of five parts. And, and I was really impressed with how the um, evidence was 
was searched for this. The first is the evidence summary that you will see, uh, results of the systematic review. The second is the benefits and harms um, that could be done. And um, in, in cases of significant harm and how the practice is now contraindicated, a stop symbol would be used normally, but there were no examples of that in this guideline. Next is values and preferences. Um, this is a section to present the perspective of the recipient of care and to examine any factors that impair, impact care access. Health equity seeks to reduce the disparities in access, any obstacles there are related to social determinants of health that are modifiable. For example, the acceptance of screening is enhanced, as I said earlier, with the therapeutic relationship has been established and a full explanation of the tool has been provided and people are more accepting of care when the person was known to them and trusted. Or a preference for self-managed care of perinatal symptoms, uh, CAM or self-care strategies, or a preference for in-person learning for nurses of depression about perinatal depression rather than online or um, other ways. Practice notes from the evidence implications for clinical practice, additional tips, considerations at the point of care. Um, wasn't written like a textbook, but it's what we could get from those studies and, and can be used at the point of care. Supporting resources, relevant resources, um, other studies, other guidelines, white papers, um, things that we could find in other ways are, are also summarized. Education recommendations. The first recommendation supports nurses and health science students to develop competencies that they need at an entry level um, to provide effective perinatal depression care. So curricula needs to integrate both theory and clinical practice. The discussion for this evidence of evidence for this recommendation includes examples of content that could be used for curricular development. The second is for ongoing professional development um, and for people to be able to participate in that, um, asking for clinical care competencies increased care provider confidence that comes. I know that's an issue that um, I hear all of the time that people maybe know it, but they don't feel confident in terms of providing care to um, people with perinatal depression. Increased frequency of asking about mental health topics and conducting screenings. The third one, perform regular self-reflection on attitudes and beliefs regarding perinatal depression. Um, this recognizes that nurses and the team may have attitudes or beliefs regarding perinatal depression that can negatively affect outcomes or result in delays of assessment and treatment. And, and I've certainly heard this over the years that, you know, the mother will say to her, um, the person to, you know, just go for a walk or buck up, you've got lots of things going on for you, and we can't as professionals keep perpetuating that. We have to reflect on our attitudes and how they affect our practice and get the knowledge that we need. So using reflective um, tools to do that, um, peer simulation and um, incorporating other members of the healthcare team. Um, you had a little bit at the bottom there, Catherine, sorry. Oh, thanks. Uh, Angela. Uh, yeah, so just to make note here, in terms of uh, self-reflection, um, RNAO has developed a resource, it's called the Nurse Educator Mental Health and Addiction Research a Resource, and that includes self-reflection activities in areas including depression, and it can be found on our RNAO webpage uh, looking under the Mental Health and Addiction Initiative, again, the Nurse Educator Mental Health and Addiction Resource. If you're an educator, um, then you may find this resource helpful for students and for staff to be able to look at what are their attitudes and beliefs regarding depression. Another resource as, um, that complements this guideline is a published paper uh, in December 27. 
in an online open access journal called BMC Pregnancy and Childbirth, so it's accessible to all. And this paper focuses on um, systematic review of evidence to identify the education recommendations for prenatal depression. Our last recommendation uh, focuses on the organization and system policy. Again, what do we need from organizations and the broader healthcare system in order to support the practice recommendations and the education recommendations? Um, as Angela indicated, they don't just happen simply by nurses and other healthcare providers wanting to do this. We need the support um, at that organizational level, and we need also an organized approach um, in order to implement these best practice guidelines. So this recommendation says implement comprehensive and coordinated mental health services and supports for perinatal depression across communities to support care strategies by nurses and the institute professional team. So the comprehensive services and supports, there we are again, we were referring back to these five components of perinatal depression care, um, the screening, assessment, the interventions, the prevention, and the evaluation, and coordinated um, across communities. So we have a lot of supports in large urban areas, we're calling you here today from downtown Toronto where there's access to many services, but if we look at across the province, if we look at in rural and remote areas, sometimes there are a lot of challenges to be able to access these same services. Um, being coordinated, so meaning ideally the evidence would say if we can have mental health services and supports available on site, we've probably got the best bet in, in clients going and actually um, seeking out those services. Um, if they are co-located, so within an organization that we have some kind of partnership with, then again, we have a better likelihood of that person accessing those services, or at, at minimum, that they're coordinated, meaning that if we're going to engage in screening and assessment, for example, that then we know what are going to be our next steps. Where can I refer this person? What kind of wait time is there? Uh, are there costs associated with that? And if there is going to be a lengthy delay, then what services and supports can, that, can I provide as a nurse or a member of the healthcare team? And I think when you look at the guideline, you'll see that there are many interventions that can be effectively provided by nurses and other members of the healthcare team. In addition, there are appendices at, at the end of the guideline, and Appendix D refers, it really is about one size does not fit all persons um, at risk for prenatal depression, and that uh, there are different subgroups at risk, such as adolescents, Indigenous people, refugees, and hence the importance of culturally sensitive approaches. Appendix E and F outline examples of the screening and assessment tools that are available. Appendix G offers consideration for implementing a screening protocol, such as cutoff scores and the feasibility. And the last appendix, uh, identified as an H, uh, addresses next steps in response to the person's risk of self-harm. In addition to the appendices, or as part of the appendices, then we have uh, guideline evaluation measures. We include these in all of our guidelines to support organizations, whether they're a public health unit, a primary care unit, acute care, et cetera, um, who are implementing this best practice guideline to be able then to evaluate what impact is it having uh, on, the, uh, on the person, on the provider, as well as on the organization. And so you can see that we have um, evaluation measures, some of which relate specifically to a recommendation, um, others that are more general as, uh, as per the uh, structure measures. And then you can see that um, some of them, in some cases, um, also include uh, measures that are in part or um, that overlap from another data repository. Uh, but another way of collecting the data to be able then to um, indicate whether or not there has been a positive impact as a result of implementing this best practice guideline. Um, this uh, uh, graphic just shows our guideline development. Uh, we've talked about already our purpose and scope and our research questions. 
Uh, all of the guidelines currently are based on a systematic review. I'm going to show you a diagram of that next. Uh, from which then we develop our recommendations and we've reviewed our three categories of recommendations. Um, our guidelines also undergo stakeholder review, which is an external review, and we thank anyone on the call today who participated in that. Uh, you provide us with some key feedback in order to make this published guideline the best quality that it can be. Uh, we want to thank our expert panel, two of whom are joining us today, Angela and Phyllis, and I believe some of our other panel members are listening on the call as well. Um, when we establish our expert panel, usually about 12 to 15 individuals, uh, we're really looking for experts uh, who bring um, knowledge in a particular clinical area. Uh, for our co-chairs, always one, if not both, are PhD prepared nurses. Um, who will help then really support the interpretation of the evidence and ensure that um, our discussions of evidence uh, best reflect the evidence and its findings. The rest of the panel are nurses and other care providers who bring a strong understanding of the clinical area. Um, they bring backgrounds in frontline and clinical care, uh, as well as academics and researchers. They also are advocates in the area of perinatal depression. So we thank all of them. We can't make our guidelines without our expert panels, and we have better guidelines um, in part because of the work of all of these individuals. And I also just want to recognize this guideline has had um, a couple previous uh, additions. I want to just recognize that Phyllis and Sue and Barb and Marilyn, Shannon and Denise and Karen all were original panel members. So on behalf of r &L and myself, we thank you very much for your contribution and your commitment to this guideline and this topic. Um, here we see the um, uh, article review process flow diagrams. Uh, this is a reflection of the systematic reviews, and I put both of them on. We did actually three systematic reviews for this guideline. Um, those of you who are a stakeholder know that it was a couple years ago that we had a draft ready. Uh, we underwent some uh, changes as far as process, and we wanted to make sure that by the time we reached publication that the guideline reflected the most current evidence. So we did a full systematic review of all four research questions from 2006 to 15, and then we did an abbreviated systematic review for questions one and two for 15 to 17, and then we went back again uh, for 2013 to 18 and did another full systematic reviews for questions one through four. Um, so these flow diagrams then reflect the work that was involved in the systematic reviews. Um, and I'll just look at um, just the table on the um, uh, left-hand side, uh, which reflects the systematic reviews for the 2006 to 15 period. Um, that you can see the number of studies uh, that were found that were identified using the search strategies that we had developed. Uh, we then dedupe all of those studies. You can imagine if we're looking at Spinel and Medline and Cochrane, for example, we're going to find some of the same studies. So we're, we do dedupe those. And then we go through the process of title and abstract screening. Where we're looking at just the title of the, the study and the abstract or the summary paragraph to determine whether or not it's applicable to our uh, research question. And you can see many of those studies were excluded at that point. Uh, then we do um, uh, a full text review. So we um, find those studies and then do a full review. And again, we're asking ourselves, does this meet our search strategy to ensure that only those studies that answer the research question are included in this guideline? And again, you can see that many were excluded. Uh, then once we determine then those studies that uh, meet our inclusion criteria, then they're assessed for quality. And again, this involves all of these steps involve two or more individuals to ensure an objective review and also to ensure the quality of the guideline. And then we're left with the number of studies that are included. And again, for the most part, uh, we include only those in terms of their quality that are of high or strong or moderate quality and not those of low. I do want to say for this one, if you were a stakeholder reviewer, um, the number of studies that we originally used from our first systematic review dated 2006 to 2015 were significantly higher than they were in the final published edition. And the reason for that was that we didn't want to include evidence from 2006, 7, 8 um, when we had newer studies from the uh, two other systematic reviews. So we made some um, uh, revisions to the final um, edition to ensure the most current evidence 
and evidence that supported the recommendations, and that there were no new, newer evidence um, that, um, that challenged the recommendations that we had established. Uh, we had, as, as Catherine said before, we had 44 stakeholder reviewers, which were really essential to give us feedback on everything, every aspect of what we did, and they did that. They also helped to evaluate the evaluation measures that were in the guideline, and as Catherine said, many of them are on the line today. So, again, thank you. And we should just acknowledge, too, that uh, our stakeholders really told us, were the recommendations feasible in practice? And it's probably the most valuable feedback. They also told us whether there were any resources that we should include. Uh, they also found a few typos here and there. Um, but the feasibility, perhaps, is the most important. A guideline that isn't feasible is a guideline that won't be used in practice and we develop guidelines with the intention, not that they just be read and, well, that was interesting and, you know, no change in practice, but that they actually be used to inform our practice, to inform education. Um, our last section here uh, is just sort of what is the what next, okay? We've got a guideline. What can I do now to make it most effective for my clinical practice or my education? Um, and this, um, this slide is just showing the process of guideline development that we talked about. And then at our annual, it's important to us also um, to um, have these other components of guidelines so that we disseminate or we share them. We support organizations in implementation and using them in their clinical practice. We also support them as far as sustainability. Consider that any time you make a change, it's important, the change is important, but most importantly is that the change is sustained. And then carrying on to that is that when you make this change, how do you know if it's uh, of benefit? So that's where those evaluation measures that we talked about uh, can be very helpful. And lastly, that last circle is looking at impact. We consider that when we use evidence, it is our hope that it is um, to have positive impact on the people that we care for. Consider also that it can positively impact us as providers. Um, the conversation, the discussion of perinatal depression can be difficult ones, can be very personal ones, can unearth a lot of um, uh, trauma and, and uh, histories of abuse and other very personal sensitive issues. So we need to have the knowledge and skills in order to effectively support someone with perinatal depression. So that can be another impact of the guidelines, not just benefiting those that we care for, it also can positively impact us as care providers and also our organization so, and our system so that we have more comprehensive, more coordinated approaches to perinatal depression. Some other suggested next steps, certainly we would like for you to read the guidelines. Um, today we're just doing a high-level overview, again, available as a free download and probably in about a month or so uh, ready as a purchase copy for those of you wishing to read the hard copy. Um, you could conduct a, a gap analysis, a process where you're examining what are our um, current practices within our organization and how does that compare to what the guideline indicates and seeing where there are alignments and where there are any uh, indications for need for changes. Uh, we also have uh, apps for all of our guidelines. Uh, this guideline is about 160 plus pages. The app is about 8 to 10 pages. So it's really condensing the information in the guideline and asking ourselves what would be the most relevant information for a frontline nurse or other care provider to have. Available as an app that's available at no cost that you can purchase through um, iTunes or Google stores. Look at it going. It's going to, yes, okay. Uh, or there also is a website, bpgmobile.rnao.ca, where you will find that same content. And every time we have a new guideline and create a new app, then it will just do an update on the app, so to reflect the most current content. Uh, we also create BPG order sets. Uh, this is taking the um, practice recommendations and operationalizing them into an order set so that we can take the evidence in the guideline and actually use it consistently at the point of care. So for example, if there is an order set on assessment of perinatal depression, it would give you essentially like a tick sheet of, of all the different components for assessment. Obviously, the person who is completing the order set then would have to have the knowledge and skill to be able to interpret what those findings mean. Um, but we do create those and those are currently uh, in progress at this time. 
Uh, you could also become an RNAO best practice champion. We have a champions network where they're learning about our best practice guidelines and how they can implement them into clinical practice. It is based on this toolkit that you see, implementation of best practice guidelines. That's looking at what is the evidence of actually taking um, a guideline and putting it into clinical practice. How can we do it in ways that are most effective, that are planned and organized? Uh, we also have some other best practice guidelines that can be relevant uh, in this area. Um, as Phyllis alluded to, uh, persons with perinatal depression are by no means uh, all the same. There are many different aspects and components, so other guidelines may be relevant. Uh, we know that part of screening can be an assessment of risk or any thoughts of suicide, uh, so we have a guideline on that. This is an older guideline from 2009, slated for revision in 2020. Uh, we also have a guideline on engaging clients who use substances, uh, and we know that someone may choose to use substances uh, due to addiction uh, as a coping mechanism. So again, that guideline can be very helpful. Uh, I didn't add to the slide it could have. We have a guideline also on tobacco interventions. Again, we know that tobacco use um, can be a coping strategy for someone who is um, faced with uh, perinatal depression and also an addiction as well. Uh, we also have a guideline on crisis interventions for adults using a trauma-informed approach. Uh, certainly everyone who experiences perinatal depression does not have necessarily a background of trauma, but may um, certainly appreciate that trauma-informed approach. Uh, this is um, an approach to care that creates uh, practices that emphasize safety, trustworthiness, collaboration, choice, empowerment, and um, focusing on strengths and the person's Skills. So that guideline, um, we did make some references to it in the supporting resources. Again, like the perinatal depression BPG, available as a free download. And lastly, um, our guideline that we released in the summer, our breastfeeding guideline, I think it's one of the longest titles, um, it includes a small section on perinatal depression and as does the perinatal depression guideline has a small section on breastfeeding. So it's talking about, so how does, um, for someone who is breastfeeding, um, the impact of perinatal depression that that can have. Angela. I was muted again. We're going to be presenting more about this in uh, February 13th in Toronto at the Best Start Annual Conference. It will be more interactive and um, making it able, more able for you to use your screening and assessment skills. So we encourage you to attend that. Yeah, it looks to be a great conference. So um, for those of you who have attended the Best Start uh, Conference before, we also will have an exhibitor's booth there as well. Um, so uh, we hope that uh, on behalf of Angela and I that you're able to attend that workshop. Uh, we also have in a couple of weeks, uh, our Nurses in the Know with RNAO uh, webinar focusing on our new breastfeeding BPG. Uh, so we hope that you're able to attend that. It's a similar format to this one uh, where you're listening in and a chance to ask questions at the end. Uh, and uh, certainly if you have any questions beyond today, again, that contact us button on the rnao.ca website. Um, also, you can reach me uh, via email. We want to thank our funders for our BPGs, the Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care, uh, that has funded best practice guidelines now for 20 years. Angela. And um, I just wanted to let you know that uh, we're very interested, some of us, in getting a national strategy for perinatal mental health. We were hoping we'd have our website up by today. Um, it's a group of mothers, advocates, uh, healthcare professionals, researchers, We've come together, um, Perinatal Mental Health Coalition of Canada is our name, and our goal will be to get a national strategy, um, more resources in terms of education that is standardized across the country as they have in Australia and other places. I noticed there's a comment here from um, Tracy about the controversial nature of universal screening. And when we were doing this guideline, that um, document did come out in the Canadian Medical Association Journal. We did talk about that. And um, if, you, if you look at, and there were responses to that from perinatal mental health experts across the country, 
and, and people were not necessarily in agreement with it. Um, we went with the um, you step the call the United States. Um, um, can't remember what the T and the E for, but prevention strategy for for um, screening, and and they still maintain those high risk populations, which obstetrical populations are the number one obstetrical complication is mental health to get um, this going. So we looked at recent evidence. We did look at their um, the, at that that comment. But just because they have not endorsed it, I don't know, Canada, as you say, but um, that's because we don't have a national strategy. It's all quite piecemeal at this time. So we're going to be lobbying for that. The next uh, minister's health meeting will be in Saskatchewan in the spring. And we have asked for this to be on the agenda. We have met with our Minister of Health about it. So. Uh, you probably have something else to say about that. Uh, yeah, uh, thanks for that, Angela. Um, and we certainly look forward to seeing um, the work of this uh, coalition and to see if it can further strengthen uh, a focus on perinatal depression and increase resources and awareness of it. Um, yeah, certainly we heard from stakeholders about you know, what the, uh, their concerns were, the ethics of screening in areas where there were not um, necessarily all of those different components of perinatal depression care. Uh, and I know that the panel felt strongly that uh, there should be advocacy in the event that there weren't a lot of options. We also wanted, again, to emphasize what role could the nurse or other care provider do to effectively support this individual in the interim. Uh, we also wanted to emphasize any of those interventions that were available online, because that certainly can increase um, accessibility. And we know that there are effective interventions, uh, talk therapies, for example, that can be provided uh, through telephone, for example, and that's a way then of increasing the accessibility. It's important, though, in doing screening and doing screening effectively um, that we are fully transparent as to what are the available resources locally so someone can make a decision regarding whether or not they're wanting to be screened and then what next steps are they wanting to take. Uh, we have a question also from Heather, and again, if you have any other questions for us, um, please put those in the chat box. Um, and we'll get to as many as we can. So Heather asks, are there any RNAO workshops being planned on this topic? Also, is there an interest group provincially where there could be opportunities to collaborate on this topic? So we do certainly at RNAO, one of our interest groups is the Maternal Child Nursing Interest Group. Um, and we could certainly uh, work with them to see if there's an opportunity there to have uh, any kind of a, a workshop or um, other way of supporting uh, the interest in this guideline. And certainly that interest group includes uh, nurses working in perinatal care. So I think there would be a big uptake in that. Um, otherwise, at this moment, I would say we don't have any other workshops planned. So um, that's part of the reason we wanted to mention that one at Best Start. Um, we certainly can take that back to um, the powers that be and see if that's something that we can do. Um, because we recognize that there is a lot of interest in this area and uh, a lot of nurses and other care providers wanting really to provide the best care they can in this area. Um, the Champions Workshop that I mentioned uh, really focuses on the implementation of any best practice guidelines. So I want to just be clear, it's not specific to perinatal depression, but certainly applicable to the perinatal depression BPG. Uh, uh, Dawn asks, how do you plan to capture other perinatal mood disorders, e.g. anxiety? Um, we did cover anxiety briefly in the background section, um, so I wanted to acknowledge it and recognize it as either an independent um, uh, morbidity, um, but also that it can, someone can present with symptoms of anxiety as part of perinatal depression. Um, for our guideline, it's important to us that we identify early what is the purpose and scope um, and ensure that then the, the systematic review and the recommendations that follow that align with that purpose and scope. There is a lot of evidence on perinatal depression, and I think you could see that from that diagram that I showed you of all the studies that we found. Uh, and we felt that to cover all perinatal mood disorders, 
uh, would have meant then the guideline would have been even longer um, and um, perhaps would have been so large that um, and just from a workload as well as just from a focus. So we wanted, we chose to focus on depression. Uh, Joelle asks, um, in the 2005 BPG, the EPDS was central, so the Edinburgh Postnatal Depression Screening uh, was, or scale was central. Can you provide the rationale for moving towards valid tools? Um, yeah, so uh, when we looked at the research question for question one, um, it focused on uh, effective screening approaches. I'm sorry, I don't have the exact wording in front of me. It wasn't asking which tool should we use. So um, this was a bit of a, a tricky dance, if you will, because we recognize, the panel and myself, that EPDS is the most commonly used screening tool, um, that it's used widely by care providers, uh, used in research studies. So we certainly recognize EPDS in the guideline. Uh, we make reference to it in our appendices in English and French and include the um, uh, practice considerations in its implementation. Um, but because our research question wasn't specifically which tool, we couldn't, uh, we can only answer the question of our research question. That really frames then the recommendations. And so that's the reason why we don't come right out and say EPDS. But I think if you read between the lines, we certainly are highly recommending it, or highly recognizing it, pardon me, um, but we also recognize other screening tools in one of the appendices. I think I saw another question that came up. Okay, uh, so Kelly writes, actually is that, yeah. um, someone's saying, Tracy's asking, do you have the reference from Canada regarding the universal screening from CMAJ? Um, I would have to go back and have a look, and we certainly can send you an email with that if you like. Uh, Jan says, I'm currently on the BPG app, and it's the older postpartum depression BPG. Um, it should be, um, thanks for checking that, um, it should be uploaded. Um, if not, in the interim, certainly going to that other web page, um, mobile, I'm sorry, I don't remember, we can put it in the, uh, maybe, um, you can put that in yep. the chat box. Uh, but there is another uh, web page where you will find that content. Um, yeah, so it will be updated um, shortly. Um, Hi. It, Kelly says, I work in a rural location and in-person support groups are not widely attended. Transportation is often a barrier. Yeah. We're looking into online supports. Is there any that you have identified as effective best practice evaluated? Um, I can. Um, I know that we have a short section in the guideline regarding online peer support, um, and that that was effective. It was an area of emerging research, so a need for further studies in order to um, fully determine its effectiveness. Um, so certainly, you can have a look in the guideline. If there's any other information you're looking for, you can certainly send me a personal email. But yes, we certainly read a lot about. Um, that where transportation or childcare were, were concerns, were barriers as far as someone coming to uh, a support group. And that's why, in part, uh, an online or telephone mechanism can be another effective strategy. It's Angela. Um, I don't remember if this literature got into, this, into the report, but... I'm wondering if there's any other questions. We have just two minutes. I just wanted to mention, um, if you do want to ask a question, you will see a little bubble um, under the slide that allows you to participate in the chat box. So if you're unable to open up the chat box, you just have to click on the bubble that's located under the slide. Hi, it's Angela. Can you hear me? Uh, Shelly has asked a question. We currently offer an education and support group for clients who may have perinatal mood disorders, as well as others with anxiety or suffering from chronic mental illnesses. Is there any harm in this, or should we be focusing on PMD only? I, I think we could only comment on the PMD because, again, our focus of our guideline was not on anxiety or um, other chronic mental illnesses. Uh, again, it's important in a guideline that it have a focus, that it have that purpose and scope. Uh, with that, though, there are always limitations. We can't focus on everything. Otherwise, I don't think we could do a good job as far as just looking at um, the key areas that the research questions identify. So um, it would be interesting just um, if um, this person, if, if, um, if Shelley wanted to be in contact with the other person regarding um, support groups just to see what, um, uh, what they're saying. 
Oh, and we're saying Angela is trying to speak. I can't hear her, but I don't think you can. Sorry, Angela, did you want to repeat something or say something? Um, yeah, there was just a few things that um, that we had uh, published. I don't know if it got into the guideline or not about we, we validated um, using CBT online, which was very successful with postpartum women. It was part of a larger study, which really went well. And, I, and, and Tracy, I think, was asking about the um, guidelines. I wanted to say that when we were doing this, we understood at the time that the Canadian Psychiatric Association and the SOGC, Society of Obstetricians and Gynecologists of Canada, were working on a guideline, a joint statement, as the American versions do. And they, they did not actually ever do it, which is really unfortunate. But what they have done instead is adopt the Australian guidelines, which do call for universal screening which is managed by COPE now, C-O-P-E. So um, that's what they did. They adopted those because there is no national one for Canada, and that will be our goal to, to do that. So, and and um, someone's asked which CBT online. It's through the University of Regina, actually. And, but we have published about it. And um, the lead author is Nikki Pugh, P-U-G-H. I can't, I can't hear now. 